Hey there, and welcome back to the series on Englishes around the world. Today, we'll go on a virtual journey around the world with the E-Wave, the Electronic World Atlas of Varieties of English. The E-Wave is freely available online, so you can actually just open the website and check out all the information that I'll talk about in this video, and you can follow along on your own screen. Now, why is the E-Wave so great? I find that it's great because you can use it to find out all sorts of information about specific varieties of English that you're interested in. So for example, let's say that you have a group presentation on Jamaican Creole. Where do you get your material? Where do you find information? In the eWave, you find reliable, up-to-date information and you find examples that have been compiled by specialists on each variety that is represented. The website is just ewave-atlas.org, so if you want to follow along, just pause this video here, open another tab in your browser and get to the eWave website. If you want to do that, do it now. I'll continue in 3, 2, 1, here we go. So let me give you a quick reminder of what I talked about in the last video. There I said that language varieties can be distinguished in terms of features on five different linguistic levels. There is the level of phonology, that is the sounds of language. There is the level of lexis, which concerns the words. Morphology, the structure of words. Syntax, how words are put together. Uh, and pragmatics, how language functions in discourse. The last video presented examples of variation that happen at each of these five levels. And the e-wave captures some of that variation. It's a resource that holds information chiefly on two of these levels, namely morphological variation on the one hand and syntactic variation on the other. Traditionally, the levels of morphology and syntax represent what linguists call grammatical structure. So the rules that speakers use to put words together into phrases and sentences. Um, okay, so the e-wave holds information about grammar and how varieties of English differ with regard to their grammatical features. We'll see lots and lots of examples for that in just a few minutes. Let me explain what the plan is for this video. So I want to discuss three issues. First, I'll talk about the varieties that are covered in the e-wave. How many are there? Where are they spoken? How are they grouped into different types? As we'll see, there are five different kinds of Englishes that are represented in the e-wave. The second big issue for this video is the database of features. Um, there are several features included in the e-wave. I already mentioned that these features are concerned with morphology and with syntax. And within those areas, there are different grammatical domains. There is, for example, verb morphology, that is tense and aspect and modality and things like that. Then there's syntax, for example, syntax in the noun phrase that would concern, for example, features that have to do with articles. I'll try to give you a first overview of what kinds of structures are described in the e-wave features and how we can use those features to differentiate between different varieties of English. In the third part of this video, we'll actually use the e-wave together in order to get some insights into varieties of English that we want to find out more about. So let's go. Um, what varieties are covered? The e-wave distinguishes between five different types of Englishes, namely traditional L1 varieties, high contact L1 varieties, indigenized L2 varieties, English-based pigeons and English-based creoles. Let me talk about each of these five types a little bit so that you know what kinds of English they actually represent. Um, let's start with traditional L1 varieties. L1 means that the speakers of these varieties acquire them as their first and their main language. And they are using these languages across pretty much all aspects of their daily lives. The adjective traditional means that these varieties are regional and they're different from the standard variety. That is, when we're talking about a traditional L1 variety, we're essentially talking about what lay people would call a dialect. Yeah? Dialects are non-standard language varieties that are typically tied to a specific geographical region. Uh, they are further characterized by a low degree of contact with other dialects or other languages, and they are spoken in rural areas 
rather than in the big cities where languages tend to be in a lot of contact. <clears throat> uh, examples of traditional L1 varieties in the E-Wave include, for example, Northern English and East Anglian English. I show you this map of the British Isles here because you might think that, well, in principle, every variety spoken in that area should be a traditional L1 variety, right? Um, but as you can see, that's not quite true. Yeah? You see, for example, Irish English or Manx English or Welsh English and the Channel Islands English. And these are classified as high contact L1 varieties, so actually a different type. We'll get to those in just a minute. Um, then there's also British Creole, yeah? uh, right there in the middle, you see the little triangle, that is a Creole. And that means that there are definitely varieties of English spoken in Britain that are not exactly traditional dialects. Okay, there are of course also traditional L1 varieties outside of Britain. For example, there's Newfoundland English and Appalachian English in North America. If you look once more at the full map of all 77 varieties that are represented in the E-Wave, you see that this is pretty much it. Yeah, so the orange squares are mainly on the British Isles, and then there are a few North American ones. Okay, let's move on to the next category, high contact L1 varieties. Here we actually have two different kinds. The first kind of high contact L1 variety are so-called language shift Englishes, as for example, Irish English and Welsh English. These are varieties of the first diaspora where English moved out from its birthplace, so to speak, to neighboring areas where it eventually replaced the languages that were spoken in those areas. Um, the second type then are transplanted L1 Englishes or so-called colonial standards. This type includes New Zealand English and Australian English. These varieties were always spoken by L1 speakers of English but over time, because of their geographical separation from other speakers of English, they developed their own standards. And so today, there is a standard way of using Australian English that is appropriate for formal and official situations. And then, of course, there are also different varieties of Australian English. Right, let's look at some E-Wave varieties that are classified as high contact L1. Two examples are spoken sort of midway between Brazil and Africa. And you might wonder, okay, so they're in the middle of the ocean. Why are these called high contact? Yeah? In the middle of the Atlantic, how much contact is there really going on? Um, well, the reason is um, we have contact in the title because the foundational speakers of these varieties came from very different backgrounds and they spoke different traditional L1 varieties. Think, for example, of the sailors who found themselves on a boat to St. Helena. Did they all speak the Queen's English? No, not really, yeah? So they were speaking a variety of different dialects, and these dialects were mixed in the new surroundings, and that's why these varieties can be really called high-contact varieties. They're mixtures of other dialects. Right. Um, let's move on to the third variety type that is represented in the E-Wave. Uh, these ones are indigenized L2 varieties. These are post-colonial Englishes, and perhaps you remember from uh, the first video Schneider's dynamic model of post-colonial Englishes. So that model actually describes what happens with these varieties. Um, so these are non-native indigenized varieties that emerged in colonial territories via the education system that was put there by the colonizers. Examples here include Malaysian English and Pakistani English, and the term indigenize means that the variety has been adopted as a local variety that is used in education and in other official domains. The label L2 means that these varieties are a second language for most of their speakers. So at home, they would speak one or two other languages, and then at school or at work, these Englishes are acquired as an L2, as a second language. This means that not many speakers actually have them as their primary or first language. 
Indigenized L2 varieties typically carry overt prestige, yeah? so they are used in formal and official situations, and they also have normative status in their respective communities. Okay, um, let's look at another map. Here you see several indigenized L2 varieties, including Tanzanian English, Sri Lankan English, and one more time, Malaysian English. We'll actually spend a lot of time with these varieties in this course, and we'll look at their historical backgrounds and the way they are being used right now. But for now, let's move on to pigeons. You probably heard the terms pigeons and creoles before. Um, so the standard account of pigeons and creoles, in a nutshell, is that pigeons are mixed languages that develop in colonial settings and that at first don't have any native speakers. Yeah? So when pigeons are spoken by speakers who don't share a common language, uh, that is when they emerge. And as soon as they are acquired by children as a first language, that's when you get creoles. Yeah? Now, as we will discover in this course, things are a tiny bit more complicated than that. Yeah? There will be a separate video on pigeons and creoles where we go over some of the controversies and the details that we need to consider when we're talking about pigeons and creoles. Let's just say it's kind of complicated. Yeah? Now, pigeons in the e-wave include, for example, Nigerian pigeon and Cameroon pigeon. And despite all the controversies, what's relatively uncontroversial is that pigeons are contact varieties that develop in colonial settings such as trade colonies. Okay, So they arise as a tool of communication between two or more groups. Yeah? And these two or more groups of speakers don't share a common language, which means initially there are no L1 speakers and nobody speaks the pigeon perfectly and everybody speaks it a little differently. There's lots and lots of variation and not a whole lot of systematicity. The pigeon is further restricted to the domains of use in which the two groups interact, and there it acts sort of as a lingua franca. Yeah? Over time then, pigeons acquire native speakers and they enter into further domains of use. Okay, if we look at the e-wave varieties, um, some pigeons that are represented include Ghanaian pigeon, Nigerian pigeon, and Cameroon pigeon. All three of these have corresponding indigenized L2 varieties, that is, varieties that have native speakers and that are applied in official domains of life and not just in interactions between speakers that don't share a common language. Let's come to the fifth type, namely English-based Creoles. These include varieties such as Jamaican Creole or Saramacan. As I mentioned earlier, the basic account of pigeons and creoles holds that pigeons give rise to creoles as they acquire L1 speakers. Like pigeons, creoles are thus the product of colonialism, and specifically, they're the product of slave trade and of plantations. In those contexts, the enslaved people are forced to acquire a variety of the colonizer's language, that is, in our case, English, and at the same time, exposure to English itself is very limited. Yeah? So there are many more enslaved people than slaveholders. And of course, the enslaved people themselves speak many different languages. Many Creoles develop to become the native language of the majority of the population, even after the abolition of slavery. Here you see a map of the Caribbean and some of the Creoles that are found in that region, including Jamaican Creole, Trinidadian Creole, and Saramacan. In this course, we'll talk much more about pigeons and Creoles, so stay tuned for that. Now, this completes our overview of the five different variety types that are represented in the e-wave. There are 77 varieties in total, and on the website you can click on each of them to get all sorts of information about them. Yeah? All the information is provided by specialists on the respective varieties, so this is a really great resource if you need to prepare a class assignment or a group presentation or something like that. Okay, I'm coming to the second part of this video, namely the features that are included in the database. All in all, there are 235 features that you can see if you click on the little rider that says features. And on this slide, 
uh, you just see the first 15, yeah, all of them about different uses of pronouns. But as you, sc as you scroll down, you can explore all the other features that are included in the eWave. Now, before we get into the features themselves, we need to talk a bit about the so-called feature ratings. So for each feature in each variety, we have information that is color coded in the overview that you see on this slide here. Red means that a feature is pervasive or even obligatory. Orange means that the feature exists, but that it is neither very pervasive nor very rare. It's sort of middle of the road. Yellow means that the feature exists, but that it is kind of marginal. And light yellow means that the feature is absent. Yeah, it doesn't exist in that particular variety of English. There's also gray which means that the feature cannot exist because of the structural characteristics of the variety. And white means that there is no information available. Um, this doesn't appear very often in the e-wave, but still it's there as a feature. Okay, um, now in practice, what you see in the e-wave maps when you select a feature is something like this. So here we have feature number 10, uh, no gender distinction in the third person singular uh, with regard to pronouns. Yeah, so what this means is that there is basically just one form for he or she, yeah? either he or just she. And the varieties that you see marked up in red on this map, they have this generalization of he and she. Okay, and uh, that generalization is pervasive or even obligatory for these varieties. For example, you can see that the uh, upside down triangles, yeah, uh, there are many red ones. Uh, so those would be the pigeons. And for example, Nigerian pigeon has uh, no gender distinction in the third person singular in such a way that it is pervasive or obligatory. Uh, by contrast, if you look at uh, New Zealand English, you see a diamond that is light yellow. That would mean that no, this generalization does not exist in New Zealand. New Zealand English has he and she. Um, the 235 features in the e-wave represent different grammatical domains, different areas of grammar. And um, these areas include um, the six domains that you see here on this slide. Yeah. So for example, features that concern verb endings and modal verbs, they form one group. Uh, features that concern nouns or noun phrases or pronouns, that would be another group. Features that have to do with negation. We saw some examples of negation in the last video. That's another feature group. Clausal syntax how relative clauses are formed or how complement clauses are formed. That is another feature area. Adverbs, that's another area. And of course, discourse, the pragmatic features of a given variety, that would be another feature domain. Okay, now let's do a little exercise. I would like you to pause this video and think of three features that capture morphological variation in verb endings. I've already mentioned a couple examples, but I would actually like you to think for yourself what features do you expect to find in the e-wave with regard to uh, morphological variation in verb endings? What features do you think the e-wave compilers included in their overview? Take five minutes or so and try to come up with possible features. And once you're done, you can continue with the video and we'll compare notes. Okay, if you want to do that, I'll continue right now. Here we go. So here's my list. Yeah. And I think that you probably have at least one on your list that would match as one of mine. So let's look at these. Uh, first, I have the absence of the third person singular S. Yeah. So it create instead of it creates. We saw that in our uh, sound recording of Malaysian English last time. Then the past tense ed, um, which is often absent in L2 varieties of English. So that would be the difference between he traveled with the ed and he travel without the ed. And then uh, some varieties also generalize the third person singular s 
across all persons. So it would not just be he says, but it would also be I says or you says. Yeah. So uh, the difference between I say, which is what what I have in my variety and, and you probably in yours and uh, something like I says. Yeah. OK, so let's look at the e-wave maps that correspond to these features. Here we see a map for feature number 170, invariant present tense forms due to zero marking for the third person singular. That is what this feature is called in the e-wave. And you see that I've zoomed in on a part of Africa where we have five varieties of English that actually are marked up in red, meaning that for these varieties, the absence of third person singular S is pervasive or obligatory. Uh, this concerns, for example, Sierra Leone Creole. That would be the uh, red triangle there uh, on the very left. Um, and you also see it in the upside down triangle. So the pigeons, uh, like for example, uh, Cameroon pigeon or Nigerian pigeon. Uh, by contrast, if we look at the indigenized L2 varieties, there we see some orange and some yellow, but it's not quite the same. Right, um, I'm moving on to the absence of past tense ED. Uh, this is feature number 132. It's called zero past tense forms of regular verbs. And just by looking at the map, you see that this is a very, very pervasive feature that is found in many, many different varieties of English. Yeah, And not only in pigeons and creoles, we see it in high contact L1 varieties. And of course, we see it in indigenized L2 varieties. OK, um, then we come to feature number 171, invariant present tense forms due to generalization of third person singular S to all persons. And this one has a very different distribution. Namely, I zoomed in on the British Isles and the Atlantic because there is another variety of English that has it, a traditional L1 dialect, namely Newfoundland English, where we find this generalization of third person singular as two other persons. OK, um, now I would like to show you uh, three other features that come from a different grammatical domain, namely clausal syntax. And that would be relative clauses with what, as in this is the man what painted my house. Um, secondly, uh, infinitive clauses without to, as in allow him go. You and I would probably say allow him to go, but then the varieties that don't need the to, yeah, as a matter of convention. And then the third feature concerns questions that are not inverted. So no inversion in WH questions in examples such as what he wants. Yeah, that can be a grammatical question in several varieties of English. Right, where do we find these? Um, <clears throat> let's look at relative clauses with what. This is feature number uh, 190. And you see that, for example, we find it in East Anglian English. <clears throat> uh, infinitive clauses without to, again, is a feature that we see a lot in pigeons. So that would be all the little triangles that are marked up in red. We see that um, yeah, just about all over the map. Then there are a couple of indigenized L2 varieties that have it. But you see, it's not something that is uh, particularly frequent or particularly pervasive. And uh, the next feature, feature 228, would be no inversion or no auxiliaries in WH questions. And that again is a very popular feature that you find in lots and lots of varieties and also different types of varieties. Pigeons, Creoles, high contact L1 and indigenized L2. Right. Um, there's much more that I could say about the e-wave features from these different domains, but I think that you get the picture. And so I'd like to come to the third and final part of this video where we will do a little bit of work with the e-wave. So if you haven't done so already, please go to the e-wave web page. Um, it's e-wave-atlas.org. And um, now I would like you to find answers to the following four questions. So first of all, 
Um, I would like you to find out more about the terms that you see when you look to the right of the features uh, on this feature page here. Yeah, You see the features 1 to 15, uh, starting with she or her used for animate reference and so on and so forth. But then in the columns next to that, um, one column is labeled attestation and there are percentages. So for she, her used for inanimate reference, there is the percentage of 48%. What does that mean? Yeah, And then there's pervasiveness and there's also a percentage for that, namely 45%. What is that all about? So this requires you to dig a little bit in the documentation of the e-wave, find out what attestation means, what pervasiveness means, and what these percentages are all about, okay? Right, that would be the first question. The next question is not really a question, but rather a challenge, if you like. Namely, I would like you to find a feature that is pervasive or obligatory in most creoles. Okay, can you find a feature where all the creoles, or at least most of them, agree that yes, this is something that's really typical for contact varieties that develop in plantation settings? Then, uh, the third question would be, I want you to find a feature that is pervasive in creoles, but absent in most indigenized L2 varieties. So what I want you to find is a feature that shows red for the triangles that represent the creoles. And um, I want you to, uh, well, that feature at the same time should give you light yellow um, for the indigenized L2 varieties, the circles, okay? Right, so that's something that you should find. And then uh, to round things off, the fourth question would be this. Find out what features are pervasive in a variety that is called Cape Flats English. Now, some of you will hear this uh, label for the first time, Cape Flats English. Where is it spoken? Well, it's spoken in South Africa. It is an indigenized L2 variety, and um, I've marked it up in the map that you see here on this slide. Okay, now, how do you find out information about Cape Flats English? Well, if you click on a variety on any e-wave map, you can get to a page that shows information about that variety. And you can also find out who was the specialist who provided the information about that variety. In this case, it's Raj Mestri. Raj, if you're watching this, I hope you're doing great. Yeah. And then, of course, we have information on all the features, uh, some of which are absent and some of which are pervasive and everything in between. Yeah. So uh, you can see that in this list of features and then C means that feature exists but is extremely rare. D means um, attested absence. So that corresponds to the red, orange, yellow, light yellow, and so on and so forth. You can work through that and look for pervasive or obligatory features that really characterize Cape Flats English. Right. So I would suggest that you take 10 minutes or 20 minutes to work on these assignments. And uh, then we come back together and discuss our results. If you're fine with that, pause the video now and I'm, the, I'm going to continue right now. Here we go. So you got your answers. Um, for attestation and pervasiveness, to get to the relevant information, you have to click on home and then on introduction, that is on the right hand side of the screen. And then in the contents of introduction, there is a point that says feature ratings. That's where you need to click. And that takes you to the fine print of the e-wave where you get information on attestation and pervasiveness. So attestation, uh, it says here, is a relative measure of how widespread the feature is in the set of e-wave varieties. So in two um, words, um, in what big a percentage of the 77 varieties do we find that feature? Um, and there's some kind of normalization going on with the A, B, and C ratings, and so on and so forth. So that is what gives you that percentage in the end. 
pervasiveness uh, provides a measure of how pervasive a feature is on average in the varieties in which we find them. Yeah. So that means if a feature tends to be pervasive, it gets a high percentage. If a feature is sort of attested everywhere, but it is not very frequent anywhere where it's used, it gets a very low percentage. Right, so that's attestation and pervasiveness. I would really encourage you to look through the documentation of the E-Wave because it gives you a good sense of what the compilers were after. And also it will give you a couple of answers to questions that you might have. For instance, why a certain variety is classified in the way that it is, okay? Why is it a creole rather than a pigeon or vice versa? Then um, let's look at the second question, a feature that is pervasive in most creoles. Here we go back to something that I mentioned in the last video, namely multiple negation. Multiple negation is something that you find in most creoles, as you can see here in this picture of the Caribbean and the oceans to the left and right. <clears throat> then, uh, what about that feature that is prevalent in creoles, but not so much attested in indigenized L2 varieties? One feature that you can find here is feature number 149, serial verbs. If you don't know what serial verbs are, well, let me give you uh, an example from uh, ordinary American English, uh, go plus verb, go get it, yeah? Uh, I go get the newspaper every morning or go screw yourself. That is a serial verb construction. And uh, you see that serial verbs with go, meaning movement away from, are really prevalent in creoles but we don't find them as much in indigenized varieties, not only in Africa, but also elsewhere. Okay, um, what's pervasive in Cape Flats English? I've given you a few hints on how to get to the features that are really uh, characteristic of Cape Flats English. One that you could mention is the feature of uh, me instead of I in coordinate subjects. So me and my brother, uh, instead of I and my brother. That's not a feature that's very, that makes Cape Flats English very unique, but it is one that is pervasive or obligatory in that variety. And that already tells us something. Okay, that's it for today. I hope to have given you a taste for the E-Wave and what you can do with it. So whenever I need to find out something about a variety of English, let's say for a quick example, for a classroom activity, the E-Wave is my go-to resource and it always gives you something interesting to work with. And with that, um, that's it for today. Have a good time and see you soon. Bye.